Sabbath blessings. Today we are going to continue uh, with our final part um, on the topic of mysticism in the Adventist Church. Last week we have looked at um, literal versus mystical interpretation of the Bible. So mystic mysticism from the perspective of reading and interpreting the Bible. This Sabbath we are going to look at uh, mysticism as an experience in the life of, life of a Christian believer. It's quite interesting that this practice even exists inside of Christianity because the origins of mysticism are found outside of Christianity. We've um, done a little bit of overview of that history last Sabbath. I believe that this presentation we're going is going to fully round our understanding out and it's going to be just as eye-opening as the one we had last Sabbath. So with that, I would like to invite you to open uh, with me with a prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity of coming together during this Sabbath to study your word. We ask you to be present with us by your spirit and keep the enemy under control. I ask you to use me as a vessel. I am not worthy, but I desire to be used by you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. The title of our presentation is Seventh-day Adventist Church Mysticism Revived. The foundational passage from the Bible for this presentation is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, yeah, had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. We're going to get a fuller understanding of the implications of, of this Bible verse as we progress in this presentation. Let's just do a little bit of summation of what we've discussed last week. Taking God's word as it reads is literalism. Looking for the hidden meaning in each passage is mysticism. We've seen here, Ellen White gives us a clear uh, definition or distinction of what taking the Bible as, reading the Bible literally means. If man would but take the Bible as he treats, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. In contrast with that, we have mysticism and the main figure of this way of studying the Bible is origin. His words are telling us the following. The scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they are written. So we have a, the contrast between literalism, taking the Bible as it reads versus mysticism. Um, 
looking for a hidden meaning and not taking the Bible as it reads or the, the most obvious meaning of the scriptures. Let's talk about the history of mysticism in, in the Adventist church. We've touched on it a little bit last week. Um, I believe everybody can recognize who the man in this picture is. And he is really the originator, uh, primary originator of mysticism in Adventism. In Battle Creek, the SPA ministers did not recognize Dr. Kellogg's subtle but extremely destructive teaching of mysticism, but Ellen Y. recognizing its deadly nature and fearlessly recognizing its deadly nature and fearlessly warn parents not to send their children there. Here we read um, Ellen White's warning found in Testimonies for the Church containing messages of warning and instruction to Seventh-day Adventists, page 35. Something is strange that I write, do not send your children to battle prey. I was instructed in regard to the danger of the worldly influence in Battle Creek. I have written hundreds of pages regarding the danger of having so large a sanitarium and of calling so many people together in one place. The young people in Battle Creek are in danger. They will come in contact with error. Years ago, I did not think that they would meet these errors right in the sanitariums. But when Living Temple came out and some of our ministers told me that there was in it nothing but what I had been teaching all my life, I saw how great the danger was. I saw that blindness had fallen upon some who had long known the truth. I pray that the Lord will open the eyes of these ministers that they may see the difference between light and darkness, between truth and error. So here we, we find a very pointed uh, warning from Spirit of Prophecy where she is going as far as telling people not to send their children um, to Battle Creek because they are going to come in contact with error there. And the other thing we are told here is that when the Living Temple came out, ministers, well-respected ministers from Ellen White's era did not see any problem with it and they were looking, considering that it contains the same teachings that Ellen White has been teaching all her life. What a dangerous thing that is, right? When well-respected ministers are, um, are deceived so easily. Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now been, we have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. Again, Ellen White uh, writes in Testimonies for the Church containing letters to physicians and ministers, instruction to Seventh-day Adventist, page 16. Let's move on to our point number three. What was the alpha and how can we recognize the omega? Ella White gave us all the characteristics we would need to recognize this deception so we would not be left in uncertainty. In Selected Messages, book one, page 202, we read the words of Spirit of Prophecy through Ellen White. We need not the mysticism that is in this book. Those who entertain these sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk with them and lead them away from God. I would just like to point out, um, she's talking about the book that we just mentioned earlier, The Living Temple by Dr. Kellogg. And she's clearly identifying this book as a mystical book and what is the consequence of entertaining the ideas found in this book 
that is a very dangerous one. And here she tells us what it is. The enemy can talk with them and lead them away from God. So we just need to be aware of that. That's uh, the danger of anyone who is involved in this type of error. Let's continue reading. It is represented to me that the writer of this book is on a false track. He has lost sight of the distinguishing truths for this time. He knows not whether his steps are tending. The track of truth lies close beside the, beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between truth and error. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg distilled his heresy of mysticism in a book he titled The Living Temple. It was so subtle that most of the leading brethren did not recognize it. In essence, the central pillar of his false theology was the delusion that God was by nature in man as well as in all God's created works. This being the case, man could commune with God by turning inward. Man's aspirations were merely workings of the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Man's imagining were the thoughts of God. Throughout my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist, I've heard many ideas about what is the issue, what was the biggest problem with living temple and everyone's talking about pantheism and all that. Those that are in the One True God movement, they say that he was moving into the Trinity. Now, um, we're going to see that it's going to be more clear that um, the problem with this book was a little bit different than these ideas although i'm not saying that that's not true at all but we're going to get a more clear understanding of the issues and i'm going to read this statement again this being the case man could commune with god by turning inward so this is one of the dangers and the other thing, man's aspirations were merely workings of the spirit of, of the inspiration of the spirit of God, and man's imagining were the thoughts of God. Let's keep reading um, here. Ellen White tells us in Review and Herald, October 22nd, 1903, paragraph 8, the following. All through the book, The Living Temple, Passage of Passages of scripture are used, but in many instances, these passages are used in such a way that the right interpretation is not given to them. The message for this time is not the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. Jeremiah 7 verse 4. Whom does the Lord receive as vessels unto honor? Those who cooperate with Christ. Those who believe the truth, who live the truth, who proclaim the truth in all its bearings. There are those whose minds will be taken up with smooth words and fair speeches, put into language that they cannot understand or interpret. Precious time is rapidly passing, and many will be robbed at the time that should be given to the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to a fallen world. Satan is pleased to see the diversion of minds that should be engaged in the study of the truths that have to do with eternal realities. The testimony of Christ, the testimony of the most solemn character, is to be born to the world. All through the book of Revelation, they are the most precious, elevating promises, and they are also warnings of most fearful, solemn import. Will not those who profess to have a knowledge of the truth read the testimony given to John by Christ? Here is no guesswork, no scientific deception. Here are the truths that concern our present and future welfare. What is the chaff to the wheat? 
Review and Herald, October 22nd, 1903. I want to point out a few ideas found in this passage. She tells us here clearly that the message for this time or for God's people is not the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are we? So the teaching, the core teaching of the book, The Living Temple, was that the human body is the indwelling place of God. And this is, it's going to be more clear as we progress. The ideas found in, in the book were smooth words, fair speeches put into language that cannot be understood or interpreted. And this was taking up the time, the precious time from giving the message of the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to a fallen world, which is the first, second, and third angel's messages. Let's move on to our next point. Mysticism will be revived in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ellen White warned of the subtle mysticism of the Alpha of Deadly Heresies, but then she cautioned that the following Omega would be of a most startling nature. Today, pastors and administrators are saying that they see nothing to be concerned about in Loma Linda with Dr. William Loveless and his teaching of the most startling form of mysticism. We're going to um, examine the teachings of this man here in a minute. But Ellen White in prophetic warning foretold, Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. Testimonies for the church containing letters to physicians and ministers. Instruction to Seventh-day Adventist, page 16. Now we're going to look at some clear examples of um, Adventist mystics that I found. And it's not going to be an exhaustive look. It's We're going to look at two examples. And I believe it's going to be plenty for us that with this, the ideas we learn by looking at these two examples, you will be able to distinguish then because this practice and way of interpreting the Bible is very spread among Adventism. So let's just look at it. Uh, example number one, William Alfred Lovelace. He lived between 1928, 2014. Uh, let's read about him a little bit. Uh, Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventist tells us the following. William Loveless was an exceptionally gifted church pastor and innovative educator who served at length in the two largest Seventh-day Adventist communities, Sligo Church near the General Conference headquarters on the east coast of America, in addition to Loma Linda University Church on the west coast with its diverse medical and educational fraternity. Now, here's um, the source itself. Uh, you can read, if you want to find out more details about him, I just want to show you the site where I pulled this little bit of introduction about him. Dr. William Loveless, the senior pastor of the Loma Linda University SDA Church has fallen into a most startling form of mysticism. He teaches as the church members how to practice classical Roman Catholic mysticism. He shows them how to put themselves into a trance as to have visions and communicate with that which they conjectured of. Here are a few statements he made during one of his presentations. 
I believe that your imagination in conjuring up images is dealing with equal truth to scripture. And that's a very dangerous statement. Our imagination can never equal the truth of God's word. We are going to enter into some simple exercises in preparation for meditation. So this is again um, similar to um, mystical meditation that we, we find in Eastern religions. Another idea, I can almost feel I'm floating. These are all in quotation marks are exactly his words. People who are not everyday mediators shouldn't, meditators, excuse me, shouldn't even be discussing the doctrine of inspiration because they don't know anything about it. So the, this minister, a preacher, believes that inspiration comes not by reading God's word and understanding it, but through meditation. Another statement from him, let your face sag, just let it drop. Concentrate in relaxing, which is the paradox of Christian meditation. We concentrate to relax. Another statement, there are many things you've wanted to ask Jesus or things you've been wanting to say to him all your life since you were a child. In your own words, say them to him now. In your imagination, visualize the face and form of someone outside your family who has most clearly represented Jesus to you in your life. See if you can picture them clearly now in your mind's eye. Another statement. I briefly got you in touch as you need to get your congregations in touch with the physical preparations for meditation. Importance of all are significant and our people need to know this. They need to know why it's significant. Not a lesson in physiology and anatomy, but a simple lesson in what the great mystics thought the centuries through the centuries have learned and told us and taught us about this. And last statement from uh, this pastor. What I have done is try to model for you what you can do with your church and what you should do with your church on a regular basis. If not every Sabbath, at least a couple of Sabbaths a month. So here we can see that he's clearly pushing uh, imagination over the word of God. He's claiming that uh, meditation and imagination is actually... Uh, better than inspiration or studying reading the word of God and he is also pushing these practices of relaxation and all these things here let's look at another example of um, a mystic I found his name is um, Eric Anderson, PhD. He was the former president of Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. This is how he looks or looked. Uh, he published an article in Adventist Review, January 10, 2013, entitled, What is a Mystic? going to take you there this is the article here i have it pulled up entitled what is a mystic seeking companionship with christ by eric anderson i did highlight some portions that i would like us to look at and as we are reading we're going to comment and point out some issues that I'm finding here. If this much abused word is used correctly, however, I may be a Christian mystic. Let me quickly explain myself before readers write me off as a superstitious, as superstitious or silly. I'm doing so, I want 
In doing so, I want to draw attention to an experience that is at the heart of Christian life and to testify how Christian mysticism rightly understood has changed my life. A mystic may be defined simply as someone who claims to have had a direct experience or intuition of God. The word is correctly used to describe a person whose religion and life are centered not merely on an accepted belief or practice, but on that which he regards as first-hand experience. Mystics believe that they are somehow in communication with transcendent reality. Thus, the Hebrew prophet having a mission and a Christian believer communicating with God in prayer are both mystics in this general sense. So the point of this first paragraph is that um, so he clearly identifies himself as a mystic and he um, re is basing this on a personal experience that he claims changed his life and that is a direct experience or intuition with God and so anyone, the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, or any Christian believer that had a direct communication or first-hand experience with God are therefore supposed to be mystics or considered mystics in, in this sense. Let's keep reading our highlights. To be as clear as possible, a Christian mystic practices companionship with Christ, to use Ellen White's luminous phrase. So um, we've read statements about Ellen White um, speaking against mysticism even last week and already here today. But our brother Anderson, he is categorizing Ellen White as as a mystic herself. Let's keep reading. Union with Christ. The essence of Christianity, let us remember, is not a set of unique ethical prescriptions or secret information about current events. It is instead in the language of the New Testament, union with Christ. I want to point um, this out, that from all my research on um, uh, mystical experience and mysticism, the goal of mysticism as the practice is union with Christ or union between the human and the divine. And so this uh, Bible verse, Colossians 2 verse 10, is basically um, the foundation of this, this doctrine. Let's keep reading. For me, a biblical balance was articulated by two women, one unfamiliar, the other well-known to Adventists. The English writer Evelyn Underhill first studied mysticism as a scholar and artist, but then was converted to Christian faith and drawn into Christian spirituality and as a participant. As a believer, she wrote, Concerning the Inner Life, a small book based on a series of talks that she gave to a group of English ministers in 1926. So um, I was a little bit shocked. I did go on uh, Google to search out this lady, Evelyn Underhill. She was somewhat a contemporary of Ellen White, although younger than Ellen White. And she wrote this book concerning the inner life she is a well-known mystic uh, christian author and she's not adventist she actually she is um, anglican and we see that ellen white is somehow placed on the same level with evelyn underhill What does Ellen White say? 
in her earlier description, 1892, of the believers coming to Christ, White's language is as richly mystical as the word of the New Testament epistles. According to her, when Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him, and in the contemplation of himself will be forgotten. Without this deep love, religious claims are mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. Union with Christ is the basis of our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness. She calls for communion with him daily, hourly, asserting that through the work of the Holy Spirit, the apostles and God's children today could experience a union with Jesus closer than when he was personally with them. So here we see that there are some ideas pulled from Spirit of Prophecy that although they are true, they don't fully um, reflect her understanding. We have seen in our um, previous presentation um, on the subject of justification by faith, truth and its counterfeit, uh, the truth about the indwelling of Christ through the word of truth in the life of the believer. Ellen White did understand that. She was in harmony with this truth as it was revealed um, by the messengers uh, at Minneapolis in 1888 conference. So, I would say that everything that this paragraph contains, we, we have just read, does not fully reflect her understanding. It just, uh, uh, let's keep reading and it's going to get more clear. Learning from other Christians, let us not miss echoes of other saints. Suspicious sometimes of instruction from other Christians, we should candidly acknowledge our multi-denominational heritage and admit that God's true children include Methodists and Anglicans and even Catholics. Let's read about his personal journey. I did not start out with a desire to be a mystic. Far from it. About 25 years ago, I helped design a capstone seminar for honor students at Pacific Union College and somehow we chose the Christian tradition as our theme. Each year we read great examples of this tradition ranging from Augustine's Confessions and Dante's Divine Comedy to Pilgrim's Progress, the Brothers Karamazov and the modern Japanese classic Silence. Time and again these Christian classics spoke to us in mystical language. Lay hold, I love you, beauty, so old and so new. Excuse me, late, how I love you, beauty, so old and so new. Late, have I loved you, declared Augustine in a famous passage. After he described how, he, how the created world has its reality on God, he suddenly shifted to intensely personal and concrete words. You called and cried out loud and shattered my deafness. You were radiant and resplendent. You put to flight my blindness. You are fragrant and I drew in my breath and now paint after you. I tasted you and I feel but hunger and thirst for you. You touch me and I am set on fire to attain the peace which is yours. It was only natural to ask my students, have you ever experienced anything like this? And hard to evade the question for myself. I just want to stop here and point that this <laughs> passage that we just have read, it's a very abstract passage and I don't, I don't even understand my, for myself. So... How can somebody experience something they don't understand? But let's keep reading. One important remedy for 
an ahistorical religion for Christians without a vivid sense of providence for Adventists hesitant to converse with the larger Christian world and for believers who have never experienced the fear of the Lord is in fact Christian mysticism. In my pilgrimage, I have learned that all of us require the powerful and repeated therapy of deeply reverent worship, the prayer of adoration and listening for God's voice. So I would just point out here a couple of things that are being mentioned. Um, a pilgrimage is being brought up. Um, reverent worship, prayer of adoration, and listening for God's voice. Huh? We've covered this already in, in our presentation around faith and what true faith is and how that works. Listening for God's voice just out of someone's imagination inside of someone's mind in their inner person that is contrary to what true faith is and how true christian faith should work in practical application it works through the word of god it does not work just through our own mind if we seek companionship with Christ, he will lead us to richly satisfying springs of living water. And if I say I have learned this by first-hand experience, I suppose that makes me a Christian mystic. So everything we read here was from uh, our brother Eric Anderson, who was former president of Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. get back to our main study. Point number seven, mystical union with Christ versus justification by faith through the indwelling word. It's going to be a little bit of an overview. I, I know that, but just because there's so much misunderstanding among us, both mainstream Adventist church and one true God movement or other other fractions of Adventism, I consider to do another overview of this. Just so we have a clear distinction. As we've read the article before, um, the, the main goal of a mystical experience is union with Christ or divinity. Now, we have a similar concept in our understanding under the 1888 message, but there's a very direct uh, understanding of how this works. It's not just some kind of mystery that we just meditate into and wish for and desire or, or even pray for. Let's read E.J. Wagner, Christ and His Righteousness, pages 113 and 114. Uh, the title of the chapter is called The Holy Spirit Works Through the Word. Now, whence comes this power? The answer is found in the words of Christ. The words which I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What spirit are they? The Apostle Peter, speaking of the prophets, says that it was the Spirit of Christ that was in them. So as we said before, the power of the Spirit dwells in the Word. Yeah, Christ himself dwells in the Word, for he is the Word. Who can understand the mystery of inspiration? He who can understand the mystery of incarnation, for both are the same. The word was made flesh. We cannot understand how Christ could be all the fullness of the Godhead and at the same time be in the form of a servant subject to all the infirmities of mortal flesh. Neither can we understand how the Bible could be written by fallible mortals exhibiting the peculiarities of each and yet be the pure and adulterated word of God. 
but it is certainly true that the power that was in the world that was made flesh is the power that is in the world that the apostles and the prophets have written for us. Now we can begin to appreciate more the power residing in the world. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33 verse 6. Christ, by whom the worlds were made, upholds them by the word of his power. Hebrews 1 verse 3. The power that resides in the words of revelation is the power that could speak the world's worlds into existence and can keep them in their appointed places. Surely then it is worth our while to take the time to study and meditate upon the word. I just want to pause here real quick that um, from everything we read previously, it was quite some talk about meditation, but the, the Christian meditation is always based on God's word. It's not just based on emptying our minds and waiting for God's voice to come and speak to us into our minds. Let's keep reading. It is by so doing that we bring Christ himself into our heart. So how does Christ come into our heart? By meditating on his word, right? In the 15th chapter of John, the Lord exhorts us to abide in him and to follow him to abide in us. And then a few verses later, he speaks of our abiding in him and his word abiding in us. John 4, 15 verse, verses 4 and 7. It is by his word that Christ does abide in the heart. Paul says that Christ will dwell in the heart by faith. Ephesians 3, 17. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So we, I hope you see by now the clear distinction of the mystical union with God through the practice of meditation, similar to mystical Eastern religions, and The indwelling of Christ through the word of truth, which was the understanding and is the truth of the Bible. The understanding uh, of 1888. Here I have a little bit of clarification note for us. The indwelling of Christ or Christ in new doctrine cannot be a literal indwelling of Christ because it does violence to the laws of nature according to Miller's rule number 11. This is again a little bit of an overview from last week. We talked about Miller's rules in contrast with um, the ideas or principles promoted by uh, a man named Louis Weir, who was basically the one responsible for bringing in the mystical interpretation of the Bible at a massive scale into our church and our institution, learning institutions. And so Spirit of Prophecy clearly tells us that those that preach the third angel's message use Miller's rules. So we have to figure out what is the truth around this subject the indwelling of christ and and decide the truth using no rules so the way we are testing it we are applying no rule number 11 and we see that it is impossible for a person to dwell in another person in according to lo the laws of nature in the natural world, the only time we find a person literally dwelling inside of another person is during childbearing. The proponents of this doctrine, or what I call the Christ in you doctrine, reject the figurative meaning of the indwelling of Christ by the word of truth that we just finished reading here, paragraph above. Since their concept does not fit into the literal or figurative meaning of the Bible, what it is, truly, it's a third meaning. And we've seen that last week. It fits into the concept or basically it's mysticism. 
and let's just do a little bit of overview from last week here. Um, A.T. Jones in the two republics, Rome and the United States of America, page 211. He talks about origin and his method of interpretation. It's, again, just an overview. Origin imbibed all the allegorical and mystifying process of both Ammonius and Clement and multiplied upon them from his own wild imagination. He was not content with finding two meanings in the scripture as those before him, but took the secondary sense, the hidden meaning, and added to it four additional meanings of his own. A system then stood thus. First, all scripture contains two meanings, the literal and the hidden. Second, this hidden sense has within itself two meanings, the moral and the mystical. Third, the mystical has within it yet two other meanings, the allegorical and the analogical. According to this method of mysticism, therefore, in every passage of scripture, there are at least three meanings, and there may be any number from three to six. So, as we broke down this um, doctrine of Christ in you, the hope of glory, um, with Miller's rules, more specifically rule number 11, we found that it comes in conflict, there's an issue about it, the reason why it cannot be literal is because it, it it does violence to the laws of nature. So we have to then interpret it in a figurative way. And again, based on Miller's rules, uh, if we know we are dealing in a figure, then we have to find our definition uh, for our figure in the Bible. So the the in dwelling of Christ, Christ is the word, right? So he dwells in us by the word of truth. There is no conflict there. It's a figure used by the Bible. The Bible also talks about being dwelling, let the words of Christ dwell in you. So then if we do not harmonize the two concepts, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory with um, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly, then that means, does it mean that the Bible speaks about two ways of dwelling that are of God that are maybe in conflict with each other? So we see that the only way these two concepts can be harmonized is if we uh, understand and accept the truth that our church originally held to and that is Christ dwells in us through the word of truth two weeks ago in our second message on justification by faith the truth and its counterfeit we observed an example of a counterfeit application of the message of justification by faith this counterfeit by its very nature and its neglect of understanding the indwelling word can lead its adherents into a mystical experience of union with Christ, claiming that Christ's righteousness comes to us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is the life of Christ. It's important to note that nowhere in the two parts of this presentation was it mentioned how we receive the indwelling of the life of Christ, and that is through the indwelling word, as detailed in the July 1890 article of the Science of the Times, that's the same as we read of previously in our book, Christ and His Righteousness, under the chapter called The Holy Spirit Works Through the Word of Truth. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, we're not going to go over this example. If you are watching this presentation and you have not had a chance to uh, see um, the previous messages uh, entitled Justification by Faith, the Truth and its Counterfeit. In the second part of that presentation, we are actually giving three examples of counterfeit faith that we have seen um, among leading ministers and ministries today. So I encourage you to, to watch that. But 
just to connect and round the understanding further out, I consider it important to bring this um, clarification that um, if you do not understand the truth about the indwelling of the of Christ through the word of truth, and you just rely on um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you know, through some kind of mystical way, what you are doing, you are putting yourself into the same danger of a mystical experience of union with Christ that we have just read about in uh, our article um, here found in uh, Adventist Review, January 10, 2013, written by Eric Anderson. So just be aware of that. Let's move on to our next point, number eight. And I title this questioning the literal word of God is the gateway to mystical experiencing. We're going to get back to our foundational Bible verse here that we read at the beginning of our presentation found in Genesis 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. And the serpent said unto the woman, and, excuse me, serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what does the serpent do here in his conversation with Eve? Basically, it tells Eve that God's word doesn't mean what it says. If God says you shall surely die, the serpent says ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what happens here is that the, the serpent plants the seed of death. Um, it's questioning the literal application of the word of God. And by doing so, is deceiving Eve into a mystical experience. And that is, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So just one more time, I want to point this out, that there is a correlation between what we studied last week. Last week, we spent most of pretty much all our time on mysticism from a perspective of interpreting God's word. Today, we are focusing primarily on mysticism from the perspective of a Christian practice. But what is the connection and how do the two works are related, the two things are related or connected with each other is that mysticism as a way of studying God's word or looking for the hidden meaning or do not taking God's word as it reads is what opens up um, the minds of people and it's really basically the gateway to uh, mysticism as a practical experience. Point number nine. The Omega of Apostasies, New Ageism, You Are Your Own God. By the mystical union of God with the believer, we have basically what the serpent tells us. You shall be as gods. Found a, a good explanation here. Um that we are going to read from a source called AnswersInGenesis.org around New Ageism and mysticism. And let's just read it 
and we're going to discuss as we progress. Cindy was exposed to the New Age movement through a human potential seminar sponsored by the company she worked for. The teacher of the seminar informed each attendee, you are your own God and you can create your own reality. By embracing these ideas, he claimed each employee could become much more successful at the workplace, ultimately leading to increased profits for the company. Core beliefs of New Agers include monism, all is one, pantheism, all is God, and mysticism, the experience of oneness with the divine. So I just want to point this out again that we found this idea in the previous article of by Eric Anderson that the mysticism or the as mysticism as a practice, the foundational point or idea of it is this idea of un oneness with the divine or union with Christ in the Christian realm. Along with these primary core beliefs are some secondary characteristics that are true of most New Agers. For example, most New Agers are highly eclectic. By this, I mean that New Agers typically draw their religious and philosophical ideas from a variety of religious sources. They consult holy books like the Bible and the Hindu Vedas, but also feel free to consult physics and channelers whose revelations from spirit guides are considered just as authoritative as those found in holy books. They have no hesitation in consulting astrologers and others who practice the occult, occultic arts of nec necromancy, palm reading, ball gazing, tarot cards, etc. Not surprisingly, New Agers are also syncretistic. By this I mean that New Agers combine and synthesize religious and philosophical ideas from Jesus, the Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, alleged space brothers aboard UFOs, ascended masters who live on planet Venus, and many others. New Agers believe there is truth in all religions and religious traditions. This willingness to pick and choose what they believe from various sources of enlightenment is a vivid demonstration of the arbitrary and inconsistent nature of the, of the worldview. We might also observe that most New Agers are open to meditation. So we've seen that uh, pastors promoting, Adventist pastors promoting meditation. I'm not referring to meditation on the Bible. I'm referring to an Eastern form of meditation in which one goes into a trance-like state and seeks to attain a sense of oneness with all things. The goal of meditation varies, but the common belief is that it allows one to connect to the divine or the force that permeates the entire universe. Emptying the mind and directing energies within the body allows the balancing of vital energies, which is used to promote spiritual and physical healing. The Bible is a good case in point for New Agers believe it is merely one of many holy books communicating revelation from God or the divine. New Agers believe it is incorrect to read the Bible in a straightforward way. So that's that's a red flag, a big, big red flag, right? We've seen that um, mystical interpretations of the Bible, a origin, and as well as uh, Lewis Weir promoting this, that we are not supposed to take the Bible as it reads. That's exactly what New Agers do. Rather, they look for truth by seeking hidden, secret, or inner spiritual meanings of Bible verses, especially in the teachings of Jesus. For example, when Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God, in Matthew 6.33, he was allegedly teaching people to seek an awareness of their own inner divinity. So we see that the Bible is not interpreted 
at its most obvious meaning, but a hidden secret meaning. Such scripture twisting is common among New Agers. The New Age method of seeking hidden secret or inner spiritual meaning of Bible verses violates the scriptural injunction to rightly handle or divide the word of God and not distort its meaning. Among New Agers, the basic authority of interpretation ceases to be scripture, but rather the mind of the interpreter. Man is seen as the supreme authority over God and his word. They rely on their own inner illumination as opposed to reliance upon the Holy Spirit. More often than not, New Agers superimpose mystical meanings of Bible verses instead of objectively seeking the biblical literal meaning. Actually, I was shocked. It was a few years ago on a social media post I stumbled across. Um, hosted by clearly a new ager. It was a Bible verse. The words of Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there was an, an explanation from a new ager mystical perspective. When Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that means not he is the truth, the way and the life, but me, the person who reads that verse. So I should take that, you know, personally and believe that the truth, the way and the life reside within me and not within Christ as the source of the way, source of truth and life for me. This was a, a shocking um revelation to me at the time but here we see that that's a common practice in new ageism and and it's really sad to see that um we have this type of uh, mystical interpretation of the bible so spread among god's people Moreover, in place of the biblical creator God, with whom we can have personal relationships, is a pantheistic concept which says that God is all and all is God. In pantheism, all reality is viewed as being infused with divinity. So this does, um, does coincide with Kellogg's understanding. The God of pantheism is an impersonal, amoral it, and not a personal moral he. The distinction between the creator and the creation is completely obliterated in this view. So I hope this reading from Answers in Genesis on New Ageism um, in relation to the Bible and Christianity has been a uh, eye-opening for you because it has been for me let's keep going um point number nine true faith versus mystical faith it's a point we've covered in uh not last week but two weeks ago it's an overview but somehow seems like these presentations just kind of go hand in hand with each other and I consider it important to include this statement from E.J. Wagner, Present Root, UK, March 8, 1894, tells us that faith is composed of two elements, belief and the word of God. Counterfeit faith has only one of these elements. It always lacks the word. It rests upon something else, some feeling or impression or hope or desire or process of reasoning, or upon the word of some man. Faith accepts the word of God, no matter how it reads, without questioning. Pretended faith is often obliged to explain the word away. Genuine faith, work it by love. Pretended faith either works not at all, or by some motive which has its root in self. With these facts in mind, it becomes an easy thing to determine whether you have faith in God. So we kind of see that uh, anytime the word of God is removed, then 
we are dealing with something that is a counterfeit for the truth. When we remove the word of God as the foundation for our faith and basis for any ex Christian experience that we have for hearing the voice of God, then we are moving into a mystical experience and a counterfeit faith. Point number 10, synopsis of Christian mysticism beliefs and practices. Um, it's going to be a recap, overview of all the ideas that I was able to gather and things that we've read so far, just to distill it down and clarify the most important things that we need to um, remember from today's presentation. Number one. This is, man could commune with God by turning inward. Man's aspirations were merely workings of the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Man's imaginings were the thoughts of God. This is what Dr. Kellogg was teaching, and we've seen that um, this similar type of ideas uh, come true from the teachings of this minister, Loveless, that we've read about, as well as Eric Anderson. We read this article. Point number two, communion with God facilitated by practices of meditation similar to Eastern mysticism and New Age. Quietness, importance of breathing, importance of body tone and posture. Point number three. Belief in learning from other Christian and non-Adventist authors, Methodists, Anglicans, and even Catholics. Now, that was quite clear here in this article by Eric Anderson. He was pushing an interdenominational um, perspective and also pushing uh, non-Adventist authors, this writer, Evelyn Underhill, Spirit of Prophecy, clearly tells us that we should not um, forbid this for us, that infidel authors are basically not for us to, to learn from, let alone push them or even um, put them on the same level with uh, Spirit of Prophecy and the writings of Ellen White. Point number four. Claim that Ellen G. White was a mystic. Both of these men were basically pushing this. Point number five. Relying and seeking a supernatural or extraordinary experience via direct communication with God rather than the ordinary methods of communication God has established through the written word. Now, we as a ministry have um, shared about these things that from all the studying and research we found is that God's ordinary uh, methods of communication with man are through the written word. Now, when that is pushed aside, it's a dangerous thing to seek for an extraordinary or supernatural experience while neglecting the written word. Yes, God does use supernatural or extraordinary methods of communication. And that was and is the case of prophets. Um, Ellen White had extraordinary experiences as well. God did communicate with her. But unless God chooses a human vessel to have a more higher communication or more extra, extraordinary method of communication with them, um, there's always the danger of, um, of moving into the supernatural, neglecting the written word and, and seeking, seeking, um, the supernatural over the ordinary. 
Now, what I would like to point out is that all the prophets of the Old Testament and all the prophets that had supernatural or extraordinary communication or experience with God, they have all have been well versed and have understood everything from God's word that was available and written to them. Point number six. Mysticism regards the essence and goal of Christianity to be a mystical oneness with God, not by the indwelling word as the 1888 message teaches, but by some hidden and secret ways. We parallel the, the two already, so I'm, I hope it's clear. Point number seven, the main teaching found in the living temple is that the human body is the temple for God's mystical indwelling. It's, this is a similar concept or potentially equal to the mystical indwelling of Christ doctrine that we have so, so spread and afloat today. Ellen White clearly tells us that the message for us is not the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is, is us. Point number eight, mysticism has its foundation built on the hidden or mystical interpretation of the Bible rather than the straightforward reading of it. Let's read this statement from uh, Ellen G. White in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 132. Because one of these points that we read about was that these promoters of a mystical experience inside of Adventism are recommending books from other denominations and even from Catholic sources. The study of God's word should take the place of the study of those books that have led the minds into mysticism and away from the truth. Its living principles woven into our lives will be our safeguard in trials and temptation. Its divine instruction is the only way to success. As the test comes to every soul, there will be apostasies. Some will prove to be traitors, petty, high-minded, and self-sufficient, and will turn away from the truth, making shipwreck of faith. Why? Because they did not live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. They did not dig deep and make their foundation sure. When the words of the Lord through his chosen messengers are brought to them, they murmur and think that think the way is made too straight. I just want to pause here real quick. The way is made to stray. We have we've heard the concept of the straight testimony as well that will cause the shaking. So after all the studies that we've done together and I had this conclusion for myself that the the straight way or the straight testimony is is actually taking God's word and understanding, reading God's word as, as it is written and not questioning it, accepting it, believing it, and living by that word, right? In the sixth chapter of John, we read of some who were taught to be disciples of Christ, but who, when the plain truth was presented to them, were displeased and walk no more with him. In like manner, these superficial students also will turn away from Christ. So it, it's very sad to see that the plain truth has always been unwanted. Should we um, bring the truth down to make it more palatable and more tasty for perverted understanding or the desires of people i don't think so but it's just it's just a sad thing even for us to witness as a ministry that 
the plain truth or the straight way, the straight testimony are not desired among God's professing people. Our next point, the gospel truth is not a charter for the mystic. Excuse me, I put number six because I moved them around and I didn't get a chance, but this is number number 11. And this is our last point here. I found this. It's interesting. I was not searching for it, but the Lord just brought it across my path. And I considered it was a good uh, quote to sum up our, our study for today. Um, we read in Adventist Review, November 27, 18, 1980, page 5. The definition of truth with its chapters centers upon the commands of Christ. Love becomes the motive for obedience to these commands. If you love me, you will obey my commands. The man who has received my commands and obeys them, he it is who loves me. Of those who obey Christ's commands, Jesus says, I will love him and disclose myself to him. Seeing Christ then lies in obedience to him. It is important to understand that the inner seeing of Christ is not a mystical experience built upon contemplation of the Savior, but it's dependent on obedience to Christ's commands, which is, his commands are found in the Word of God. So, let me just read again this last sentence. Seeing Christ then, or hearing Christ or having an experience with Christ lies in obedience to him. It is important to understand that the inner seeing of Christ is not a mystical experience built upon contemplation or meditation like we've, we've read before, but it's dependent on obedience to Christ's commands. These have an objective reality that is disclosed through the activity of the Spirit. Far from being a charter for the mystic, the Farewell discourses of this gospel challenge the disciple to an ethical and moral lifestyle built on the teachings and commands of Christ. They are a charter for an objective, active obedience pattern on Christ. So we've already seen that faith that works by love and purifies the soul works by relying actively on God's word and living by God's word and believing God's word. It cannot work separately. You cannot desire or see Christ or have an experience or meditate, contemplate yourself into Christ and his love for you unless you do it through obedience to his word and a study of his word. Otherwise, what you're doing, you are seeking a mystical experience and, and that's a very dangerous thing. So with that, I hope that the message has been clear and may the Lord continue to bless each and everyone, under, everyone's understanding and experience in and through the truth. Thank you. Um, and we're going to close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the clear distinction between the track of truth and the track of error. Please help us to accept the word, not as the word of man, but as the word of God. Help us to live by every word of God. And your word may dwell in us richly and bring forth the fruits of Christ's righteousness in our character. 
Thank you for hearing my prayer. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.